Satan has really attacked our marriage. And I think there's, there's a lot of cynicism that people in our church have when it comes to their marriage, current, the state of where their marriage is today. And, um, and they just don't believe it, it can really happen. And uh, it was really hard for me to preach during first service, and I do hope second service will be a little different. I really do. And so before we get started, I just want us to spend a moment in silence. And I want you to prepare your hearts. You might be recently divorced. You might be in a marriage today that's an awful relationship that's filled with abuse, physical, sexual, emotional. And we are not the kind of church that's, that will ever tell you that you gotta be in that kind of a marriage. We hope that you're getting help. Some of you have lost all sense of hope in your marriage because some of you husbands have been emasculated and a lot of you wives have been abused. And you have been together for so long that uh, you don't ever think it's gonna change. I serve a great God, and I know you do too. And because we serve a God who is the God of the resurrection, that he took Jesus who was dead for three days and he resurrected him for the day, from the dead. I do believe he can do that with your marriage even today. But in order for that to happen, your hearts have to be ready to hear and listen. Jesus, one of the things he always says after he taught something, he always ended by saying, those who have ears to hear, hear. Yeah. And today my hope is that you would have ears to hear because what we're going to learn today might disturb you a little bit because you've never heard anything like it. And I don't want you to leave here feeling cynical about marriage. And so can I just give you a brief moment to be silent and to go to God? If you're watching online, could you just be silent? If you're in the gym sanctuary, in the nursery, I know it might be hard in the nursery, but still just be silent and say, Holy Spirit, God, speak to me today. Whatever way you would want to hear from me. I'll give you a brief moment to do that, and then I'm going to open us up in prayer. God, I pray that every person in this room that is married, I pray, God, that you would give them such a heart of thankfulness for their spouse. God, I pray that you would help every married couple in this room to see their husband or their wife the way you do. That you would give them that fresh perspective today. And I pray, God, for every single person in this room, God, that they would realize how holy the institution of marriage is. And God, that you would help them to absorb everything that's going to be taught by you today so they can be ahead of the game before so many of us. So Holy Spirit, would you come? Jesus, would you come today? And would you help us because Satan is destroying marriages in our church and outside of our church all over the world. And so God, I pray that the words that come out of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts in this room, I pray God that it would indeed be pleasing unto you. And all of God's people said, amen, amen. Well, I've been married for 20 years, a little over 20 years now. I dated my wife for about seven before uh, we actually tied the knot. So I've been together with Jenny for 27 years. Folks, I'm only 45. <laughs> I've been together with her for more than half my life. Right? And, so, and, and it's been great, it really has been. But uh, you know, uh, I, I believe this to the core of my heart. I'm not just saying, sometimes lip service is cheap. You know, you're like, ah, he doesn't really mean it, but I really do. My wife is more beautiful today than she was when I met her when she was 19. Oh, isn't that sweet? She really is. I got proof. Check out these pictures, all right? Come on, let's look at her. Look at that. All right, so she's still cute, but this is when I just met her. Look at the second picture of her. She wasn't even happy to be next to me. I had to teach her to smile a little bit, all right? Uh, and then let's look at like a couple years after. We were still in college. You see, she's getting cuter, right? Okay, next. This is a couple months ago. Jenny, right? And uh, show some more pictures. 
hubba hubba, right? I was in Mexico. And then the last one, we were in Florida uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, I was officiating a wedding down there. And uh, she got so much more beautiful, didn't she? I, I, I got to believe I played a role in that in some ways, all right? Uh, but when I think about her beauty, it's not just glamour. So many of us in this room, we attribute beauty to being glamorous. It's so much deeper than that. Now, I do believe she's beautiful, and I, and I think you would agree with me on that. But folks, you only see a little bit of that beauty. I know the depth of her beauty because she's my wife. There's a beauty that I know about her that you will never know, and you're not supposed to know. Only I am. And I'm grateful for that because I see her in that way. And there's nobody more beautiful to me than her, simply because I see that beauty in a beautiful way. It took such hard work for me to get here today, for me to be able to say that with the utmost sincerity. It took so much hard work. And you know, we started this series, 2020, because it's a whole new decade. And we asked ourselves, what would it look like if we can look at the next decade of our life? What is God's will for our life in the next decade? And what I wanna do today is that I wanna set us in a track on a 10-year path, right? What is God's will for your marriage in the next 10 years? What could be the possibilities? Do you believe that for all of you in this room, the best days of your marriage are still ahead of you, they are not behind you? If you are single here today, you are so lucky to be able to hear a sermon like this, because if I heard this before I got married, it would have helped me so much. It really would have. And so my hope is that today as we talk about this, we're going to sort of discern what's going to happen and, and how do we sort of discern what is God's will for my marriage over the next 10 years. We're going to talk about that. But you need to understand that marriages are being attacked deeply today because we live in a world where we have secularized this institution and I think I get it and it's okay. But even in the church, we've secularized the way we see marriage. And it's really horrible that we've come to that conclusion where we just secularize our marriage and we don't see it no longer as sacred. As a result, 50% of all marriages end up in a divorce. And that's exactly the same statistic in the church. You need to know that just the people who believe in Jesus get divorces at the same rate as those who don't. It really shows that we have secularized the institution of marriage. It's a, it's a, it's a harsh reality. Chris Rock, a famous... Uh, comedian says this. He says, do you want to be single and lonely or married and bored? There is so much truth to that statement. And I know it's supposed to make people laugh, but all good comedy has truth to it. I don't want you to raise your hand, but how many of you are bored with your spouse? 50% of all marriages end up in a divorce and the other 50% who are married are hardly ever happy or content with their spouse. It's just the reality. Tim Keller puts a bunch of statistics up in his book, The Meaning of Marriage. He says in 1970, 89% of all births were to married parents. Today, only 60% are. That means 40% of babies are being born out of wedlock. 72% of adults were married in America back in 1960. And you know today, since 2008, it's only 50% that are married. Uh, marriage is truly a sacred institution in which God created. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the sanctity of marriage today, the way God sees it, the way God always saw it. And when God created Adam and Eve, what he had intention for that, that's what we're going to learn today. And so could I answer this question, which we're going to focus the entire sermon on today? What is the secret to marriage? What is God's will for your marriage over the next 10 years? You want to know what it is? And it might take 10 years. I hope it doesn't take that long. Hopefully, maybe in two, three, four years, you can get there. God's will for your marriage is simply that your marriage will become a sign and a wonder for God. Your marriage will become a sign and a wonder for God. If you are single, please write this on your phones. Take notes. When I get married, God wants my marriage to be a sign and a wonder. What does that mean? That means when people look at your marriage, it points to Jesus. That means when people see your marriage and they're in, they're, they are close in a relationship with you, in a relationship with your husband, in a relationship with your husband or in a relationship with your wife, that they would actually encounter the very presence of Jesus Christ. Parents, what would that look like if your kids encountered God through your marriage? 
greatest gift you can give to your kids today is for them to grow up where they can see that mom and dad are so into each other, where they can see mom and dad can't even keep their hands off of each other. It's one of the greatest gifts you can give to your kids. Stop buying them all this stuff and junk. Give them. <laughs> all right. Thank you for that response. Hey, keep responding. I love it. I love it. But um, so we're so concerned about buying them stuff, but their greatest need is to see you and your spouse live a life where they see Jesus. That's one of the greatest discipleship tools you can give to your kids. And it can happen. But you've got to sanctify marriage again. You've got to change the way you see it because many of you see marriage the way the world sees it. And when that happens, we have no hope. And so I want to spend the rest of our time. And I'm going to do it. I got so much stuff to share with you today. I'm going to try to do it as fast as possible. How do we make our marriage a sign and a wonder? How do we make our marriage a sign and a wonder? Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 31 and 32. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery. Underline that word, profound mystery. But I am talking about Christ and the church. Now, Paul, he takes verse 31. It's not his words. These words are recorded in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. These words are so profound that Jesus utters them in the Gospels, and we find that Paul shares it not just once, but twice in his epistles. Powerful powerful. And uh, it's such provocative teaching because back during Genesis times, when uh, they taught this, it was so counterintuitive to what the culture was teaching. A Hebrew man's number one priority was never to their spouse or even to their children. It was always to their parents. And in an Asian culture, you kind of understand that at some level. And so when he was penning those words, they were so provocative because he was saying, your parents are no longer your greatest priority. It's your spouse. That's huge. And Paul is saying that when a man leaves his father, he's supposed to leave his father and mother, and he is to be united with his wife, and the two will become one flesh. In the Hebrew, that word united literally means to stick to your spouse. That's what that word means. And the two become one flesh. He says it is a profound mystery. Another way to translate that is that it's a sign and a wonder. The only relationship you have here on earth where the Bible actually compares it to Trinitarian relationship that God has with the Son and the Holy Spirit is marriage, right? Because Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the three are one. What does it say in, here in Ephesians 5.31? It says, the two become one flesh. And so it's truly sacred. You get to experience a little bit of what God experiences with the Son and the Holy Spirit. If you can see today that marriage is sacred, you have to prescribe to that, because if you don't, then you're never going to believe that it can be. Your marriage is supposed to be a sign and a wonder for people to see, and it would remind them that one day when they get to heaven, they will be married to Jesus Christ. That's what your marriage is supposed to be. So therefore, your marriage isn't private. A lot of us think, well, you know, I'm, a little, I'm a very private person with my spouse. I get that. But your marriage was never meant to be private. It's public. It's supposed to be a sign and a wonder so that people can encounter your marriage and they can get closer to God. So that this church, as we're living together in relations with each other, that as people come in contact, that they would be able to connect with God in a very deep way as they see your marriage because they see it as a sign and a wonder. Your marriage is never to be private. It's supposed to be public. Because it's supposed to be a sign and a wonder. Paul says it's such a profound mystery. Paul doesn't even know the depth of this because he's never been married. And for him, it's always going to be a profound mystery. But for those who are, you have an opportunity to experience what God experiences with the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's a beautiful thing. And so how can that happen? How can our marriage become a sign and a wonder? The first thing is this, our marriage must become a sign and wonder when it is our first ambition. Your marriage doesn't have a chance if it's not your first ambition. Hey, if you're working 100 hours a week or 90 hours a week, there's no way your marriage can be a sign and a wonder. Impossible. Now, if you have to do that maybe a couple months out of the year, that's understandable, but if that's the norm of your life, there's no way your marriage can be a sign and a wonder. Sunita talked about vocation last week. And I really do believe you might have to reconsider a new vocation if you're working too much. I'm telling you this right now, it's better to be poor and in love with your spouse 
than to be rich and miserable with him or her. There's no money in the world. There's no house in the world that's ever going to make you feel good and think, I'm glad I have this person in my life. There is none. And so it's better to be poor and in love with your spouse than to be rich and miserable. But for many of you, you drank the Kool-Aid. You've drank the Kool-Aid to just focus on success and money and wealth because what marriage has become to you is that it's become a trophy. And you want to show off that trophy to everyone around you. And that trophy is shown off not by trying to become one. That trophy is shown off by what kind of house you have, what kind of car you drive, what kind of bags you carry, how good you look. And so we've sort of prescribed to that rather than the depth of what really God wants us to do. So we have to make it our first ambition. So just ask yourself clearly, what are you prioritizing in your life and where is your marriage in that priority list? And parents, I would say this, your marriage has to be so much far above than your job because if you... It's if it's almost on the same level, your job will always win because it's so much easier to focus on a task than a relationship. Hands down, it will always win. So your marriage has to be so much higher than your job, otherwise it doesn't have a chance. And I would say as well, your marriage has to be so much higher than your kids. And that's really hard today because if anything, our kids are more important than our marriage. And for a lot of you, you know what the scary thing is? You're still married only because of your kids. That's dangerous. Do you think your kids are going to grow up and they see Jesus through your marriage when the only reason why you're married to this person because they're the parent of your child? There's so much more to than marriage than just that. And so it has to be so much greater. Now, I know for some of you, because you have little ones at home, it's just different. And I get the life stage. I embrace the life stage. But it's just the life stage. It's just for a while. But there's still ways now you can think about how I can grow deeper into that marriage. I'm really excited about Pastor Clay starting this newlywed ministry. So today, they're going to be sharing with you the youth group at 1.30. Pastor IJ is not going to be the full-time youth pastor for Metro Community Church. He's going to take over the, the, uh, the junior high and senior high ministry. We're really excited about that. And Clay is going to step into this new role where he's going to work with newlyweds. I'm really excited about that because these newlyweds, the first five years of a newlywed's life in their marriage are the most critical years of their marriage. They build the foundations to how they're going to relate, how they're going to communicate, how they might resolve conflicts or not resolve conflicts. After the fifth year, many marriage experts say this, it's very difficult to change. That's why your parents will never change. They will never. I mean, there has to be literally an act of God for them to change. They will never speak to their, each other the way you think they need to be speaking to each other. They'll never change. So those five years are so critical. So Clay's going to step into this role where he's going to try to create an opportunity for you young couples because so many of you get married. It's great. So that you have every opportunity to do this. And can I just encourage you right now if you're married, can you get a marriage coach? Find a marriage coach. We have some amazing married couples in this church. Say, hey, man, can we get together and be open and get them to coach you a little bit? Right? You guys have no problems getting coaches for yourself when it comes to your careers. You have no problems getting coaches for yourself in other areas, like for your kids and math and science and English. You get them a coach all the time, spend tons of money on them so they can get great coaches, so they can succeed. My son goes to coaching for baseball twice a week so he can succeed in the sport. Marriage is the most important relationship on earth. How come we don't have a coach for it? How come we're not willing to pour in some of our resources so that we can invest in this relationship, so that we can experience this idea of two becoming one? So get a marriage coach. You can hire them. They're called counselors, marriage counselors. And if you have the funds, I don't know why you wouldn't spend money on that to get a coach to help you so that your marriage can be a sign and a wonder so you can learn what it looks like to make marriage your very first ambition. Can I encourage the single people? The great thing for you to do while you're single today is for you to grow in just such love and passion for God. And really the best thing you can do honestly, right now while you wait to get married, and Sunil may talk about this a bit more next week, is simply to grow emotionally healthy. Nothing will sabotage your relationship with your spouse when you are emotionally unhealthy. I'm a living testament of that. And if you can grow and learn about why you do some of the things you do and become a student of your life, I think God's going to really speak to you in a very profound way. So go get a marriage coach. And some of you can just do some reading. The, one of the best marriage books I've ever read is by an author by the name of Dr. John Gottam. He wrote a book called The Seven Principles of Making a Marriage Work. He's not a Christian. It's a secular book, but it's a fantastic read. I highly encourage you to do that. 
all right? And so marriage has to be your first ambition. What does that look like? What does it mean to make marriage your first ambition? You ready for this? It's to make your spouse feel loved and lovable. This is why there's so much pushback. It's to make your spouse feel loved and lovable every day. It's not about you just saying I love you because a lot of you say I love you. But ask yourself, does your spouse feel loved by you? Do they feel loved by you? And do they feel desired by you? That's the way you make your, that's the way you make your marriage your very first ambition. And can I just, husbands, it's our job primary to do this first because this is what Jesus says in Ephesians 5.25. He says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands, what is our role? We are to love our wives the way what? Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? Yeah, he died for the church. You know, we like to look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, when it says, wives, submit to your husband's authority. And we have no idea that your wife has no right to do that unless you first love her the way Christ loved the church. So the submission that Paul is asking of us is far greater than our wife's submission to us. We have to be willing to die to our spouse, to our wife. That's the goal. When you do that, then you will be willing to love them and make sure that they feel lovable. So how do we make our spouse feel loved and lovable? How do we make marriage our very first ambition? Here it is, two things. First is incarnational listening. We have to incarnationally listen to our spouse. What does that mean? What does the word incarnation mean? It's what Jesus did. Jesus, who was God, he lived in heaven. He lived in a heavenly world. What did he do? He left the heavenly world, and he entered into the earthly world where we lived in. He left heaven and came to our world to be with us, to show us how much he loves us and cares for us. Isn't that what he did? Can I get an amen to that? And so incarnational listening is simply this. You leaving your world and you entering into your spouse's world when they speak to you. That's incarnational listening. Especially if they're sharing some things that issues they may have with you. That you leave your world and you enter into their world and you try to understand why they're sharing what they're sharing. And husbands, I got to caution you because sometimes when our spouse starts speaking about things or maybe sharing their problems, what we often do is we go into problem solving mode, don't we? We just want to fix them. Well, you should do this, 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 and that. And they're not sharing necessarily with you so that you can fix them. In fact, they probably don't think you can fix them at all. They just want to feel loved and lovable. That's it. That's why they're sharing it with you. Not for your advice. And if your partner shares with you issues they may have with you, don't be like me and try to figure out a way to flip it and blame it on them. It's not a, it's not a game. It's not about you winning. And so many times you enter into conflicts and arguments in a place where you want to win all the time. It's not about you winning, because you really win when you can make your spouse feel loved and lovable. You lose when they don't feel that. And they walk away feeling unloved and unlovable. And we do that all the time, don't we? I do it all the time, and you gotta catch yourself. Conflicts are normal, Metro, they are, but how you deal with them will determine whether it's normal or abnormal. So incarnational listening, okay? Um, the, the, The question you need to ask yourself is this. Does your spouse feel closer to you when they are done talking with you? Just ask yourself that question. After they speak to you, ask yourself, I gotta ask myself, does Jenny feel closer to me after she just shared with me? Or does she feel further away from me? That's incarnational listening. If you can say yes, that's incarnational listening. Counselors say, experts say, marriage experts say, 70% of all conflicts are resolved through good listening. My, uh, my professor at Fuller, David Osberg, or Dr. David Osberg, one of the best counselors out there, he wrote tons of books on counseling. He says this in one of his books. He says, being heard is so close to being loved that for the average person, they are almost indistinguishable. Incarnational listening. You get that? When you can incarnationally listen to your spouse, they feel loved and they feel lovable. Second, forgiveness. Forgiveness, all right? Uh, You gotta be good about forgiving your spouse and you also have to be very good about asking for forgiveness. But when you ask your spouse to forgive you, don't say I'm sorry. It's the worst thing you can say. Because when you say I'm sorry, you're still in control. Here's what you have to say. 
will you forgive me? You see, that puts you in a vulnerable place where you now have to wait for your forgiveness and you give your spouse the power to forgive you in her or his timetable. And you don't force him to forgive you. And, and can I just share this with you? You should never ask for forgiveness until you can first feel the offense that you've caused your spouse. Don't ever ask for forgiveness until you can first feel the offense you caused your spouse. I like to get rid of conflicts right away. And so sometimes I like to just say, I'm sorry really quick, or will you forgive me really quick in hopes that we can just get through it. But don't do it until you first feel the offense that you've caused. Years ago, somebody asked Jenny, my wife, during church service saying, how do you and Peter resolve conflict? Because they were going through some hard times in their marriage. And my wife is not a marriage counselor, um, but she gives a very honest answer. Here's what she said. She said, well, usually what happens is that Peter will wake up in the morning and pray. And then after he prays, he usually comes and then he asks for forgiveness. Well, basically what she was saying is that 99% is his fault. <laughs> it's not my fault. It's his fault. So he'll go and pray and God will reveal to him what he did wrong. And he'll come back and ask for forgiveness. And it's really true. It's really true. But I need, to, I need you to understand. I don't go to God necessarily and say, oh, God, would you show me the offense I've caused my wife? Because I'm usually very angry with her. I pour out my heart to God about how angry I am with her, how selfish she might be. These are my ideas. And I start writing it all down. I journal all that stuff. And it's like, it's dark. I let it all out. I let, I let her have it with God. I don't ever say that to her in her face. And then when I let it all out, God will show me a perspective of that situation or that fight that I had never seen before. Yeah. And what he's doing then is that he's showing me how much I hurt her by what I said and what I did. And that's why I'm able then to go up to her sincerely and say, will you forgive me? Because God has already shown me what I did to her. You cannot do this. You cannot forgive without God. Now, can I also encourage all you uh, married people that before your spouse even asks you to forgive you, you are required under God's covenant to be in that process of forgiving your spouse. You can't just say, well, I ain't gonna forgive you until you for ask for forgiveness. That's not the way to go because really your forgiveness is for, your, for you, not for your spouse. Because what does it say in Ephesians? Paul says, do not let the sun go down in your bitterness, otherwise you give the devil grounds to your soul. Foothold is grounds. That means he has a legal right to live in your heart. And when the devil lives in your heart and you start to live in that bitterness towards your spouse, what do you think is going to happen in your marriage? So you've got to protect your own heart and your own soul. If anything, just pray for your spouse. If your spouse is not a Christian, I want to encourage you to pray for them. Pray that they will come to know Jesus Christ. And I hope that you will ask others to pray with you fast for that. And also, may you be Jesus to them. May your character reflect the very character of Jesus in hopes that they would come to know Jesus in that way. All right. Um, when you got married, and hopefully a pastor officiated your marriage, you made a vow to God. A vow is a promise. Right? For a monk, when they commit a vow, when they make a vow, the most important thing in their life is to fulfill that vow. And I hope that many of you, when you got married, you took a vow to God that you would be with your spouse. Look at what it says in Ecclesiastes 5, 4, and 5. I mean, it's just so blatantly obvious what he says about vows. When you make a vow to God, do not delay to fulfill it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. It is better not to make a vow than to make one and not fulfill it. Your marriage is a vow. You took a vow before God and before witnesses and before a pastor. You took a vow that you will be with this person for better or for worse, in plenty and in want in sickness and in health, till death do you part. That is the vow you took before God, and I hope that you will do whatever you can to fulfill that vow. It requires you not to say, if my husband changes, this marriage can be better. Yes, I do believe your husband needs to change, but what it requires is this, where do I need to change first? You need to change, your husband needs to, we all need to change, and you can only be responsible for your own transformation. You cannot be responsible for your spouse's. So you got to say, what can I do to be transformed so that I can be a better lover to my spouse? That's going to be key. So guys, first ambition, what is it? Incarnational listening, forgiveness. You do those two things, your spouse will feel loved and lovable. Second, our marriage becomes a sign and a wonder when it is rooted in passion. 
when it is rooted in passion. Verse 31, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. In order for the two to become one flesh, you have to have passion. Do you believe that God's love for you is passionate? Do you believe that? that can I get an amen? Is God's love for you passionate today? Do you think Jesus would have went on that cross and died for you on the cross if he wasn't passionate about you? Right? He's passionate. God doesn't love you because he has to. Oh, God, I guess I got to love them because I created them. That's not why God loves you. He loves you because you're irresistible. That's why God loves you. And so our relationship with our spouse, our love for our spouse needs to be deeply rooted in passion. It cannot just be through commitment. I, I guess I gotta love her because I married her. I mean, I guess I gotta do that. And here's the worst thing the church has done over the last, you know, thousands of years. They have taught us that marriage is just about commitment. BS. If marriage is just about commitment, that's just like you going to work every day. How much do you hate your jobs? Oh, gotta go to work, gotta pay my bills. When there is no passion, in your committed relationship with your spouse, marriage becomes a prison sentence. And so you need passion, because without passion, there's gonna be no revelation of the depth and beauty of who your spouse is. If you're single, again, you can cultivate that passion by being passionate for God, because you can never be passionate for somebody else unless you're first passionate for God. And so work hard in your relationship. Work hard in growing. David Hossein's got a, got a class being taught called uh, the uh, um, soul train, soul training. Sign up for that. That's going to help you to walk in your relationship with God in a very deep way. Can I just read Ephesians 5.33 for you? However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. All right? Each of you must love his wife as he loves himself. Now, Paul is under, this, under the presupposition that men love themselves. And you do. You love yourself. You love to be right. You love people respecting you. You love people, you know, just complimenting you. You love yourself. He's saying that you got to love your wife the way you love yourself. As much passion as you have for yourself, that's the kind of passion you need to have for your wife. And the wife, it says, you got to respect your husband. Now, can I just share this for you ladies? I know respect is earned. I know it is, but when you don't respect your husband, it's gonna be very difficult for that husband of yours to love you well, the way you wanna be loved. So forgive the mistakes the best you can and try to love passionately because when you respect your husband, you're gonna give your husband the opportunity to love you passionately and you'll be able to passionately love your husband as well, all right? And so I guess uh, the big question is how do we, how do, we do this? How do we grow in passion? I got three thoughts. The third one's the longest one, but the first two are pretty quick. Gonna go through it really fast. How do we grow in passion? First is pray for it every day. Pray for it every day. As you wake up, you say, God, I pray that Jenny would be passionate about me. I always pray for her passion before I'm passionate about her. I always say, God, would you please, please make Jenny to be passionate for me, for me. Let her have passion for me. I always check up on her. I was like, did you pray for passion today? It's like, no, pray for passion. Pray for passion, woman. Pray for passion. She's not a very passionate person. You saw that photo in college. She just looked like she saw a ghost, right? Pray for, I said, God, would you please give Jenny passion for me? For me. And then I also say, God, would you please give me passion for her? Every day. Why? That'll take you 10 seconds, guys. Why can't you pray that prayer? Because God is so passionate about your spouse that there's no way you can even come close to that kind of passion. And you're gonna need to tap into the passion that God has for your husband or your wife because you don't have it. Human beings, we're not passionate people 24-7. It's impossible. And whenever we get into a fight, we just don't have passion anymore for our spouse. And so pray for it every single day, every day. Pray for passion for your spouse and that your spouse would have passion for you. Second, think about your spouse throughout the day. Do you think about your spouse when you're at work? You're like, no way. No, me? No. Some of you don't even think about your spouse when you're at home with them. And sometimes your spouse feels completely invisible around you because you don't even think about them even when they're standing right there in front of you. 
Think about them throughout the day. You're never going to have romance in your relationship unless you think about them. Think about when you started like dating. You were the best version of yourself when you started dating your spouse, right? Like they, they could come out late. Like you wait for them in the car for a day. They'll come out 20 minutes late. You're fine with it. Because why? You're, you're passionate. You're the best version of yourself, right? You drive two, three hours to see them if they lived in another state. You don't mind driving two, three hours to see them and drive two, three hours back. Why? Because you're the best version of yourself. Because you're passionate, right? You pay, like back in the day, phone bills were expensive. You pay hundreds, thousands of dollars for international bills because maybe they lived in another country or they went there for something. You'd be gladly paid that. Why? Because your love is so passionate for that. Why, why does it have to end when you get married? Why? Why can't it be greater and greater as you are married? Folks, romance is not an illusion when you get married. It's a revelation. But you got to be able to work for it. You got to think about your spouse throughout the day. The last thing about growing in passion is you need to know the difference between secular and sacred sex. That's why Dan said kids, if they're kids here, they go, I don't mind if kids are here, but if you don't want to have uncomfortable conversation on the way home, you might if they're here. <laughs> you really will. 99.9999% of you here watching online in the gym sanctuary and everyone in the nursery, you guys all prescribe to secular sex. You believe in secular sex and that's why your marriage is horrible today. God created sex, Metro. It's a gift. Do you know Adam and Eve were having sex before they ate the fruit? So it's holy. Do you know for a Jewish man on the Sabbath, Sabbath is the most important thing for a Jewish person to observe. Do you know one of the things they have to do on their Sabbath is have sex with their spouse, their wife. And not only just have quick sex, they're supposed to make love and make sure that their wife is pleased with them. Why? Because sex is holy. It's sacred. It's not secular. And for so many of us, we have secularized the sex thing and that's why we think it's awful and, and we don't want to engage with it and we're too scared to even talk to our kids about it. You're, listen, I, I don't want to scare you, but if your kid is past eight years old and you have not talked to them about sex right now, you're in big trouble because your kid's friends are creating the foundation of how they see sex. And many of us, because we didn't grow up in homes where our parents talked about that stuff and we think sex is dirty. We grew up in a church being taught that sex is dirty. We grew up in a church teaching you that the only reason why you should have sex is to have kids. (laughs) Guys, that's the voice of the devil, not of God. Sex is not just for you to have kids. It's for the two to become one flesh. That's what sex is. It's the greatest physical representation of the two becoming one flesh. So what's the difference between secular sex and sacred sex? Can I just go through this? I got five different differences between secular sex and sacred sex. Take notes if you can, all right? First thing, secular sex sees sex as an activity. It's really about like performance and technique based and, and, we, and we judge it based upon that. Secular sex sees sex just as body parts coming together. That's all we see it as and that's why it's dehumanizing. Because all we see is body parts coming together. That's why for guys, like if you're single, you can have sex with a woman on the street. As long as she looks good to you, let's go have sex. Why? Because all you see is as an activity, you just see body parts coming together. And when we do that, what we do is we objectify women and even men. And you can do that in your marriage as well. You can objectify your wife. You can objectify your husband when you do that. I hear some um, married couples saying, man, we should have had sex before we got married. Because we are not sexually compatible. That is the secular way of looking at sex. You just see it as activity. And some of you think and you believe that people should have sex before they get married because... If they're not compatible, you're not going to have a healthy relationship. No, the reason why your marriage isn't healthy is because you don't see sex the way God sees it. Sex is not an activity. God sees sacred sex as communication, not as an activity. When you have sex with your spouse, it's not about what you're doing to them. It's about what you're communicating to them. Sex is something you say more than something you do. When you have sex with your spouse, what you are doing every time you're having sex with them is you are renewing your wedding vow. You are saying that no matter what, there is nobody in this world that I will do this with but you because I love you 
and we have committed ourselves to you. And for so many of you in this room, it's been a long time since you've renewed your wedding vow. Now, I know for some of you, um, you have medical conditions. And if that's you and you have medical conditions, I totally get that. And we have to be sensitive to that. And I encourage you to get as much help as you can through doctors and other people to help you through that. But if you don't have a medical condition, sex has to be about communicating to your spouse how much you are committed to them. Sex communicates this oneness where the two become one flesh. This Trinitarian language of being a part of the Godhead. It's communicating that to your spouse, that I am united with you and I will never leave you. That's what sex is. Sex, second thing about secular sex, secular sex teaches that sex is secondary. I'm talking about marriage. When you're married, sex is secondary, right? Oh, oh listen, we'll have sex when we have time. We'll have sex when we get, well, first let's get all this stuff done first, then we'll have sex, all right? Um, some of us, we don't have sex unless it's like the perfect ambiance. So that's why sex is secondary. And in marriage, that's the case. When you get married, it's amazing how you want to have sex with your spouse before you get married so bad. And maybe you guys do, you do. But then once you get married, you don't no longer have sex anymore because it's become secondary for you. Sex, sacred sex makes sex primary. It's not secondary, it's primary. Sex is the priority of your life in your marriage. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. Oh, come on. Sex is the priority of your life when you are married. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. In order for you to be in the world and not of the world is when you make sex primary. Your marriage is a sexual vocation. Your marriage is a sexual vocation. And you need to see it as such because the two become one. It's that important. I want to encourage you to be naked in front of each other. We call that skin to skin. Now, if you're in a healthy place, you may not need to do this, but if you guys are really struggling to even be intimate, if you're struggling to share and get to know each other in our heart, the best thing you can do is talk about how long, like my, my marriage coach, Pete and Jerry Scazzaro, said you should be naked in front of each other for 20 minutes at a time. They do it every single day. They're crazy, right? <laughs> They're crazy. They're pastors. Uh, he's the author of Emotional Healthy Spirituality and Relationship. He has skin to skin every day for 20 minutes with his wife. They're naked. They like getting naked everywhere together. <laughs> all right? Because what it does is that it's showing how intimate, how one they are together. So what skin to skin is this, it's this thing where you get naked, but you don't have sex. You connect, you touch skin to skin, and you share words of encouragement with each other, building the bond. The only time you get naked is when you have sex with your spouse. There's something wrong with that. You shouldn't be afraid to be naked in front of your husband or your wife because you should be naked and not afraid. That's what can happen when Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead. It's a foretaste of heaven. It's a return back to Eden. Be naked and not afraid. All right, it's a very important thing that you need to do. All right, skin to skin. Marriage, again, is a sexual vocation and we need to make sex primary. Sex primary. All right, the third thing. Uh, secular sex sees sex disconnected from your spirituality. We always do. Right? You don't see sex as spiritual because when you look at the world, I mean, it's dirty. And then in the church, we always say how dirty sex is. Sex is so dirty. Sex is so dirty. And then you read letters of Paul, and Paul talks about how dirty sex can be. Sexual immorality is what Paul says is dirty. Not sex with your spouse is dirty. And so the church, we believe that it is, and you believe it is, and you believe sex is so dirty. And so you cannot engage within it because you think it's dirty. You think it's sinful, but it's not sinful. It's, one of the, it's, it's really a holy thing you can do. Sex is not just an activity, and I get it for a lot of you. If you've, been spiritual, if you've been sexually abused, I totally understand why you would see that sex is bad. And I hope that God will redeem that part of your life. Because with your spouse, if he doesn't redeem it, it's going to be so hard for you to be naked and not afraid, and so hard for you to be one, to two becoming one flesh with your spouse. Sex is disconnected from your spirituality, secular sex. That's what they teach you. That's what you see. All of you believe that. Sacred sex teaches you that it's deeply connected to your spirituality. Meaning this, when, I th when you think about spiritual practices, what are some spiritual practices? You think perhaps, of course, praying, reading the Bible, 
fasting, all those are spiritual practices. But what you need to see today is this. Sex with your partner, with your spouse, is a spiritual practice. It's just as important like prayer is. Meaning this, sex will help you to get closer to God in your marriage. Amen? Amen. It will. (laughs) My marriage coach, Pete, he'll tell me, and like, I just, I'm blown away by this guy because he's returned back to Eden, the things he sees sex as. And uh, years ago when he used to pastor his church, he's no longer a pastor, he just teaches the emotional and spirituality all over the world now. But before, he, he still preaches like maybe once or twice a year at his church. But this is what he'll say to his wife, Jerry. He'll say, Jerry, tomorrow is Saturday night. Tomorrow I gotta preach to 2,000 people at church. I gotta get close to God. We need to have sex tonight. It's not manipulating her, guys. Please don't. <laughs> and she would say the same thing. Because she preaches there too. She'll say, honey, I got to preach to 2,000 people tomorrow. And I got to get as close to God as I possibly can and make this message well. We got to have sex tonight. Folks, they don't even go to prayer meetings sometimes. Important prayer meetings for the church. Because they know that their primary obligation is to each other. And sex is their primary vocation that they offer themselves to each other. And I'm telling you, they're old. They're in their (laughs) 60s. And they can't keep their hands off each other, man. It's gross. The way they are so into each other. It's like Kevin and Linda Swanson. They're the same way. I I, I I, I, I couldn't believe them. I'm like, you guys have been married for so long, but you, you guys can't keep your hands off each other. God can redeem your marriage if you can see sex as being sacred. Sex is not disconnected from your spirituality. Sex is spirituality in marriage. The the fourth thing, we see sex as, uh, secular sex sees sex as intercourse only. That's all you see. So when you're married, you're just about, all right, let's hurry up and have intercourse and let's get it over with. So much more than that. See, some of you, you folks, you're married, you have sex, and once you're done, you turn on the TV and you watch NFL football right after you're done. All right? And you completely ignore your spouse. Right? Some of you ladies, you'll maybe turn on the K-drama stuff or something afterwards, and you'll watch something else right after. Sex is more than intercourse. You have to make sure that your spouse is feeling something deep and powerful even after you have sex orgasms. That there's a deeper connection that you have with them. You can have a lot of intercourse with your spouse but not be close to them. Just like you can pray a lot and not be close to God, right? There are people who, I mean, I know know pastors who wake up five o'clock every morning, pray for a few hours every day, but yet they're still so far away from God. You can have a ton of intercourse with your spouse. It doesn't mean that you're gonna be close with them. Sex is not just intercourse, but secular sex as it is. Sacred sex sees sex as lovemaking all day. You have to learn to make love to your spouse every single day without having sex, because you can't have sex every day. It's just not, I don't think it's possible. Maybe maybe it can be, but it'd be hard, all right? But you got every day, you gotta say, how can I make love to my spouse without having sex with them? How can I do that? And do it every day. Flirt with them on texting. Tell them how beautiful they are, I mean it with your heart. No wife in this room hates to hear their husband say you're beautiful. They're never going to say, stop saying that. How dare you say I'm beautiful? <laughs> no. Find ways to make love to your spouse every day without having sex. Yep. Maybe it's going shopping with them, not saying, hurry up! <laughs> Let's go! Just say, take your time, honey. Last Friday, my, my kids were away at the retreat. Nobody was home. It was so great. My wife and I had two nights to ourselves at the house. And the first night, we went to a restaurant. And we were eating, and the problem with my wife eating is that um, I eat in two, three minutes. I chew about six times before I swallow. Uh, She chews about 800 times before she swallows, and I'm serious. It takes her so long to eat. And and that day, though, because we didn't have to go, the kids were not home, I just said, honey, take your time. She looked at me and she said, wow, what's gotten into you today? (laughs) Folks, I just made love to her. 
when I said, take your time. I did. I just like, I just really loved her yeah. without having sex. Yeah. I said, take your time because you're worth it. Yeah. Chew 800 times before you swallow. I don't care. <laughs> sex is more than just intercourse. It's about you making love to your spouse every day without having sex. Yeah. Maybe doing a hobby that you may not like, but you know your spouse loves it. Maybe going and doing that for, with them for a day and saying, I'll do it because I love you so much. I don't necessarily like this, but I'll do it. That's what lovemaking is. Learn to make love to your spouse every day without having sex. Something amazing will happen when you begin to do that. And then the last thing about secular sex is this. Secular sex teaches you that sex is best when it's spontaneous. Right? Like, oh, it's got to be natural, organic. Like, it's got to just come naturally. Or get me in the mood, you know, and stuff like that. It's like, come on, I'm not a superhero. I can't just turn you on like that that quick. Right? You don't have sex, like when you're tired, like I'm too tired to have sex. So it's just spontaneous. Whenever like it's the right moment, we're gonna do it. And that is, I mean, listen, that can be like, um, like maybe supplemental. But se secular sex just says, let's just do it spontaneously. And that's why you guys struggle so much. Sex, sacred sex is planned and intentional. Talk about it. Say, hey, how can we plan this out a little bit? When can we have sex? Let's plan it out. And when you do that, you bring it before the Lord and you pray. And you say, Jesus, could you just help me tonight? Because I'm going to have sex with my wife. I'm going to have sex with my husband. Would you help us to get closer and be one as we do that? You've got to plan that out if you're going to go before the Lord. So spontaneous is like, you know, somebody's saying, well, how, can I just pray that we would have sex without talking about it? That's still Spontaneous. You got to plan it out and write it on your schedule and say, okay, here's what we're going to do this week. Okay. Talk about it. Make sure that both of you are happy. All right? Talking about that. It's one of the most beautiful things you guys can do. Plan it. Be intentional about it. Don't just wait till it's spontaneous. Plan it. Our marriage becomes a sign and a wonder when we make our spouse our first ambition and we have passion for them. And when we do that, then everything flows out of our marriage. Everything we do, the fuel of everything we end up doing is going to be from our marriage. And that's how it's supposed to be if you're married. I, the fuel of my ministry here today doesn't come from just my relationship with God. Primarily, it comes from my marriage with my wife. I couldn't do this, this ministry stuff today if it wasn't for my marriage with her. And so when I started dating her, I grew up in a broken, I was a pretty broken person. And so I had a very cynical view of her when I first started dating her. And here was my cynicism towards Jenny. I didn't think she loved me enough. And I questioned if she really loved me. So when I started dating her, you know, I, I wrote her some letters that I, you know, just poems. I spent like time on that stuff. And I'm not a writer. I don't, I'm not a natural writer. It was hard. There was one time she didn't even recognize, she didn't even tell me she got the letter. She got it, but she didn't even tell me she received the letter. Oh man, I just thought she doesn't deserve my love. And I question if she really loves me or not. When I was in college, I wrote her a few songs. Now, I know they weren't the best songs. But it's the thought that counts, right? I'd invite her to the music room and I'd be on the piano, I'd be playing the song that I wrote for her. And I would hope that maybe she would cry a little bit and just say, no one's ever wrote a song for me. Thank you for being so loving. She just would smile and she said, oh, that's nice, honey. Thank you. She doesn't love me enough. She don't love me. When um, we got married, and um, I started this church, um, I said to her once, I said, hey, honey, uh, you know, I get up early on Sunday mornings because I got to get ready for church, and I do set up every Sunday. I said, you know, I, I don't even have time to make breakfast. I got to get up like at 3 if I want to make breakfast for myself. I said, would it be okay maybe if you can get up and make me breakfast once in a while? Be, it really would help me because I don't eat till like 2 o'clock during the, during the Sunday. You know what she said to me? She said, I'll try, but that's going to be very hard for me to wake up early. I just said, man, she don't love me enough. <laughs> oh, man, I'm going to be in trouble tonight. Um, <laughs> I would get haircuts. Oh, no. She'd have no clue I got a haircut. And I would just use that as ammunition. Like, you see, you don't really love me. You don't really care. It's like, I'm sorry, I just didn't notice. I mean, I, I could literally shave my head off and she wouldn't notice. 
I mean, she's just oblivious to that stuff. And it used to really bother me, really. And you know, I asked her this week, I said to her, I said, honey, um, when did you feel like you were my first ambition? When? And, you know, you, I would think she would need to think about that for a while, but she answered me right away. She said it was six years ago. I said, really? So for 14 years, you didn't think you were my first ambition <laughs> of our marriage? She said, no, you were, you were not. I was not your first ambition. And she was absolutely right. Because as much as I always thought cynical about her loving me well enough, and I felt like she never loved me well enough, I certainly didn't love her well enough. I never did. Every argument I won, and I always blamed her for it. She would always say, you know what, I guess it's my fault again. Always, because I would always win. I'm eloquent with my words, and she's not. And I'm able to flip it and manipulate it. When she was hurting um, with Kayla in her, in her second pregnancy when I started Metro, I didn't have a time for her. We lived with her parents. I said, I don't need to even focus on you because your mom and dad take care of you. She struggled with morning sickness. She threw up many times during the meal times. And I would just not even care. And that hurt her deeply. Years ago, she had really bad herniated discs and she couldn't even get out of bed. She couldn't go to work for a couple days because it was so bad. And I didn't really care about how bad it was because I still made her do dishes when she could barely stand on her feet. Because I felt like in some way she didn't love me enough, so I don't got to love her much. And I said, when did you start feeling like you were my first ambition? She said, probably on the second sabbatical that you went to when we went out to Korea. And I said, that long? 14 years? And you see, that was three years after me just being transformed with emotionally healthy spirituality and I started to work on it and so forth. And uh, I went for it, man. And I had a great coach like Pete and Jerry to really pour into me and pour into my wife about how we can get deeper and more intimate together. And it was just great. And this past Wednesday, I tell you, it was just kind of like the, the solidifying moment. I got a haircut. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> she came home at six o'clock. Again, okay, completely oblivious that I got a haircut. And then, you know, Thursday I went to the office and I met David Hosang in the bathroom and he looked at me and then not even a second, he goes, oh, you got a haircut. <laughs> I said, yeah, yeah. Thank you for noticing, David. I really appreciate that. Thank you. I cook dinner, we eat. And probably like hour, 90 minutes into her being home, completely oblivious that I got a haircut, I just look at her and I just start laughing. I'm like... And she looks at me, she goes, why are you laughing? I said, you are like, you are hilarious. <laughs> you are so funny. She goes, why? I'm not even saying anything. Why am I funny? I was like, you just are. You have no idea how funny you are. And then she looked at me, she goes, you got a haircut. You got a haircut. I was like, yeah. I got to literally laugh for you to notice that I got a haircut. That evening, she said to me, she said, honey, you know I love you, right? Even though I don't notice you get a haircut. And I said, yeah, I know. And here's the thing. When you, like, when you see marriage as something that's sacred, what used to be a reason why I doubted that she loved me, that she didn't notice a haircut of mine, actually now is one of the reasons why I think she's so beautiful. That God showed me that because she doesn't see every detail, minutia of me, that she'll never harbor on the things that I've done to hurt her. The things that I've done perhaps maybe that would want her to quit being married to me. That for her, her love is so deep and so unconditional that she never pays attention to the little things because she knows the bigger thing about me and that she loves me for just who I am, not the way I look or not the way I present myself and not being a pastor of this church or whatever, but she loves me just for who I am. That's when your marriage becomes sacred. And so today, will you stop secularizing your marriage and will you make it sacred before your God? Make your spouse feel loved and lovable through incarnational listening and by forgiveness and pray every single day that God will allow you to be passionate for your spouse. Let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer. If you're with your spouse today, could I encourage you to just hold their hand? 
And I'm gonna ask you to renew your vow by making them your first ambition and by praying for passion every day. And if you're single here today, I want you to pray that God would help you to get to that place where your marriage becomes your first ambition and that you would be passionate about God so that you can be passionate about your spouse. I'm gonna give you just a brief moment to do that and I'm just gonna pray for us. So go to God. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and his church. God, I pray for every marriage in this church. I pray you would sanctify it. I pray that you would make it holy. I pray that we would be able to see our partner, our spouse, the way you see them. And I pray for those marriages right now where it's on life support. God, remove the scales from our eyes and help us to see our husband or our wife the way you do. I pray that every married couple in this church today will make a vow to you that they would make their partner their first ambition and that they would make a vow to you, that they would pray every day, that they would be passionate about their spouse. And they would stop believing and practicing secular sex, but they would practice sacred sex from this day forward. Sanctify the marriages in this church. For every single person, God, I pray that they would make a decision to work so hard at growing and becoming more emotionally healthy so that when they do find that person in their lives, that they can enter into this marriage without having to struggle so much so that even from day one of their marriage, their marriage would be a sign and a wonder. God, I pray that people in Englewood, outside of Englewood, would come to know you simply because of the marriages in this church, that it would be a sign and a wonder that it would point to you and to our future marriage with you, Jesus. So be with Metro. God, I pray that you would speak I pray that we would go for this, that we wouldn't stop fighting for our marriages. It's in your name that we pray, amen, amen. There's some next steps that I'd love for you to take. The first one, um, I, will mo I will model incarnational listening with my spouse. Just flip over your communication card, there's some next steps there. All right, that's the first one. Second, uh, I will pray for passion every day for my spouse. Just start doing that. Third, this week I will schedule a time to have sex with my spouse and spend time praying before I do it. Fourth, sex is sacred in marriage, therefore I will maintain a life of celibacy until I get married. As a single person, how could you decide to have premarital sex after what we just learned about what sacred sex is? You can't, you can't. God's not a prude, he's not. He just sees it as a sacred thing and he wants you to as well if you're single. Fifth, please sign me up for Emotionally Healthy Relationship Workshop in October. Mike teaches it. My pastor, Mike, it's phenomenal. It's not just for marriage, but it's for just how do we live in healthy relationships with people. Some of you don't know how to do it because you never were given a good model. And you always think everyone's got some issues against you. But maybe it's your issues that people have an issue with. Maybe you need to grow in those areas. How can you do it? He gives you some great tools on how you can do that. And lastly, I will give to the Christmas offering. All right, and Tim, can we just see how much we have raised so far in the Christmas offering? $98,100.13, we're about a little under 50% there, all right? Uh, today's the last time, I pray that you'll give very generously as we do that, because so many lives are at stake through this Christmas offering. And then, uh, this is not on it, but uh, David is doing soul training starting next Sunday. If you need to know how to grow in your faith in God, I highly encourage you to do soul training, all right? Sign up for that, you can sign up for that at the table.